Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. I bet people are going, oh no, not the meters again. Well, it just struck me that I paid a bit more for this one. So I didn't pay a lot of money for it. It's not a scientific instrument. But it should be performing better than I have thought it was. So I've decided to do a few experiments and also do a bit of work on the environment I was trying to use it in. And the thing I wasn't... Well, I suppose I may have read it in the past, but it didn't sink in. Trying to get pH readings of RO water is very iffy. There is no buffering in pure water, so it's notoriously difficult to get a true reading. So if you think about what I've been trying to do, I've been trying to set and calibrate my pH meter using the RO water, which on reflection is probably a daft idea. But um, nonetheless, when I had a reliable pH meter, um, I consistently got a reading of a pH of 7 from my RO water. Now, because I've changed the um, flow rate, I do get a higher TDS reading now. It's double what it used to be, but then it's still incredibly low. So instead of being a um, TDS of 9 or 10, it's now 2021. That's still incredibly low. But nonetheless, there's a little bit of something in there, but it's not enough for the pH meter to perform well. So um, given that my RO water always was 7, it may have crept up a little bit. It could possibly be 7.1 now, but... Um, I calibrated this pH meter last time with great difficulty and got a stable reading of 7.1 in actual fact. So what I've been doing now is um, every time I've got something mixed up, I've been using the pH meter. And quite honestly, the readings I'm getting are about right. So I don't think it's the meter that's the problem, it's the way I was using it. But I'll keep my eye on it. I mean, that water it stood in now has got some feed in it. Nothing else, just, just a low-level fertiliser. So to give a reading of 6.9 is about right, given that it started at 7.1, not 7. Um, and in my mind, I've been guessing the pH, and quite honestly, I've been guessing accurately based on my previous figures in my head. You know, a sort of um, TDS reading of around 100 or 80 to 100 was dropping the pH down by one or two, sorry, 0.1 or two points. So, um, yeah, I don't think this meter's as far off as I thought it was, but I'm still gonna use it with caution and down the line I may invest on in something a bit more um, scientific, shall we say, so that I can just take it out, use it, and not have to faff around, which is what I do now. But that stabilised quite quickly in that water because it's got some buffering in it, because it's got some feed in it, and it, the, the meter seems to perform better when it's got something to read, if you see what I mean. Anyway, these are some thoughts. OK, I just filmed my pH meter and had a chat about it. Now I want to extend that to this. Now, I've got three Vanders. This is one of them, yeah? We have top growth, we have pretty healthy looking leaves in the main, we've got an extensive root system with some growing tips. There's no problems hydrating that plant. The other one is currently being hydrated that I want to look at. Again, we have top growth, we have pretty healthy looking leaves, pretty even coloration, and then we've got this one. This one has a problem. Okay, it is producing top growth, but there are there's signs of chlorosis all over this plant, including right near the top of the plant, and it extensively gets worse the farther down the plant you go, right down to the base of the plant. So that's the problem. Now I'm going to go and sit at the computer, and we're going to talk over the analysis to try and find the problem. Because at the moment, I'm a little at a loss. I've got three Vanders, two of them are fine, and this one over the last month or two I would suggest has done this and it's getting worse 
So I need to analyse this and sort out what's wrong. Or try and sort out what's wrong. May never do it. Okay, I've set myself up on the computer and stuck the camera in front of the screen. You won't be able to read all the writing, but what I'm reading I will talk through. So first of all, some ground rules. Three Vanders, they've all had the same light. They've all been fed and watered the same throughout the winter period. And they've all had the same temperatures. Different Vanders react differently to those elements. So, um, but... I haven't had this problem in the past, but what I have done this winter is drop the temperature down lower. That could be a factor, it could be the problem, just on that one. But anyway, um, last year my thermostat was set at 15, which allows it to drop to 14 and then my heater brings it back up. This year I actually had that set at 13 for some of the winter, which meant it dropped down to 12 and came back up to 13. Yeah, so that's effectively three degrees, uh, two or three degrees difference, and that could be it. But um, maybe. Uh, the other thing I want to exclude is the possibility of a viral infection. That is highly unlikely on the grounds that, again, all three get the same treatment. <coughs> all three have been owned for some considerable time. And the markings have not got the hallmarks of um, virus because they are chlorotic, chlorotic spots, I think is the expression, which sort of are just a yellowing spotting effect. But it's affecting the plant quite badly. So um, we'll go in and have a look at some things. The first question is pH and nutrients. Now all three have been treated the same, but that doesn't mean to say they're reacting the same. Um, We'll have a look at, uh, where are we? Where's my chart? Right, this chart is very useful. This is nutrient mobility and the relationship and effect they have on the plant. It's a very useful chart. Um, so if we just go down these um, nutrient elements and see what they get used for, and in the process of looking at what they get used for in the plant, we can either say that could be the problem or it's not. Now nitrogen, as we all know, is one of the major factors. Formation of amino acids, vitamins and proteins and cell division. Um, is that likely to form chlorosis? Highly unlikely. It's more likely to, you know, uh, a lack of it would produce wishy-washy new growths. Um, sorry, too much of it would produce wishy-washy new growth. Not enough of it would limit growth. Yeah? Phosphorus, energy storage and transfer, cell growth, root and seed formation and growth, winter hardiness. And um, it affects the way water is used in the plant. So that's a possible. Yeah? Mm, iffy. Potassium. <coughs> carbohydrate metabolism. Well, your carbohydrates are, um, uh, I think they're to do with... Um, Come on, brain. Photosynthesis, um, part of the process of photosynthesis, producing the sugars and things, allows those things to be in the plant. Breakdown and translocation, water efficiency, fruit formation, winter hardiness, disease resistance. So obviously, we need all three of those, and the plants have always had all three of those, and they've been having the same, roughly the same amounts for a very long time. Nothing's changed. Yeah? What I will say is that. I haven't mentioned pH yet, yeah? Right, now let's get on to these next ones. One of them is a little bit of a problem. Calcium, well we all know that if you've got a calcium deficiency, in the main you're affecting your new growths because it's a non-mobile element. So you tend to see the lack of calcium as a problem in the new growth area rather than in the older part of the plant. And if you think about that vander, most of what we were looking at is the older part of the plant. So I'm going to rule calcium out. But let's have a look at what it gets used for. Cell division and formation, structure building, we know that. Nitrogen metabolism. And it helps with translocation. So that's moving stuff around the plant, even though it's a non-mobile nutrient. So nitrogen metabolism, go back to nitrogen. What does that do? Well, we know it produces growths. 
Uh, probably not. Yeah. What about magnesium? Chlorophyll production. It's what turns the leaves green. Now we're getting on to possibilities, but look a bit deeper. Phosphorus mobility. Phosphorus, energy storage and transfer, formation and growth, winter hardiness. So the link between magnesium and phosphorus can probably be excluded. <clears throat> but let's see what else magnesium's used for. Iron utilisation. Right, so magnesium helps with chlorophyll production, phosphorus mobility and iron utilisation. So let's quickly switch down to what iron does. Chlorophyll formation, it's an oxygen carrier, helps with cell division and growth. What's the magic word that's linked between both of those? It's chlorophyll, isn't it? So iron and magnesium go together to help chlorophyll production. So yellowing, spotting and yellowing of the leaves is lack of chlorophyll. So I think we might be getting closer now. Now comes the worry. I'm just going to stop the camera for a minute. Right, I'm back. We might get interference from Mr. Cat here because he's come down for a fuss and he's not getting it. Um, out of these three that are joined together, they're not micronutrients, um, but they're not macronutrients. We've done calcium, we've ma done magnesium, and now we get to sulfur. Do you see sulphur on that list? This is my MSU fertiliser. Well, I'm sorry, I can't see it. Now, can you imagine the production of a fertiliser like that spread around the US in large quantities actually having a mistake on the label? And somebody not getting back to the source and saying, You've missed sulphur off your label. Okay, I'll get that fixed then. If that's not on the label, it's missing. And it definitely is not on that label. You've got your, um, your NPK at the top, 13,315. You've got your calcium and magnesium, 8% and 2%. Some might say that magnesium's a bit low. But nonetheless, this is supposed to be a balanced fertiliser. And then under that are all the micro elements. Yeah? And sulphur's not on that list. And that's just suddenly struck a worry in my mind. That came to me today. Why is sulphur not there? And do you know why it came to me? Somebody was asking about the rain mix, a Kerr's rain mix. And... Um, Quite honestly, sulphur is not only there in the rain mix, it's there in vast quantities such that... No, come on, pussycat, don't get in the way. Go and sit quietly. Um, it's there in vast quantities, and we all know that sulphur is capable of burning, and I concluded, along with quite a few others, that the sulphur was a bit heavy-handed in that particular um, fertiliser. But in this particular MSU formula, it seems to be missing. And what does it do? Amino acid formation, enzyme and vitamin development, seed production, chlorophyll formation. Hmm. Now when we get down, down to the micro elements, um, they are tiny little amounts, and all, all you can generalise in saying is that they all need to be there in some f shape or form. But just picking out, you know, what they do. Boron, pollen grain germination, seed stuff, does help with sugar translocations, but I think we can exclude that. <laughs> Chlorine, roll, not well understood. Well, we'll miss that out then. <laughs> Copper. It's a metabolic catalyst. That means it needs to be there to make other things work and join together. Functions in photosynthesis and reproduction, increases sugar, blah, blah, blah. So again, we've got photosynthesis in there, but I've got copper. Iron, chlorophyll formation, yeah? Right at the front of the list. So I suspect that possibly. Manganese, enzyme systems, aids chlorophyll synthesis and um, P and CA availability. So that needs to be there, albeit in small quantities, to make our P and CA work. And our P 
is our phosphorus and our Ca is our calcium. Yeah? What else we got down there? Molly Boden Bodenum. Oh Nit nitrate Regi I can't even say that. Converts inorganic phosphates to, orga to organic. Well, we don't need that. <laughs> We're not growing in soil, so that's probably not really utilised. Nickel, nitrogen metabolism and fixation disease tolerance. Zinc, hormone and enzyme systems, chlorophyll production, carbohydrate starch and seed formation. So I'm not too worried about the micro elements apart from the iron, which links with the magnesium and both help with chlorophyll production. So that's at the moment my port of call. But I need to sort this out. Why is sulfur not included at all in this particular formula? Now that seems odd. Especially as it's um it has a consequence of helping with chlorophyll formation. So it may be that our magnesium is okay and our iron's okay, but the lack of sulphur, bearing in mind these things are sort of interrelated in some shape or form, may be causing me a problem. But then why only on one plant and not on the others? So it's difficult to say. Okay, so that's just a, a chart. And... Um, <clears throat> What else can we have a look at? We could have a look at um, oh come on, can't even type now. Let's have a look. Nutrients and pH chart with orchids. I'm trying to specifically look for stuff relating to orchids. And I'm going to pull up several of these charts. Um, there are a few. <laughs> and unfortunately, a hell of a lot of these are to do with hydroponics. But an awful lot of those that are to do with hydroponics are to do with growing weed. Emphasis on the word weed. Yeah? That stuff can grow six inches a day. It's not an orchid. Orchids have got nowhere near the growth rate of your old wacky backy stuff. So if the chart is specific for growing that type of plant, I personally will semi-disregard it, but the fact that it's a chart for hydroponics shouldn't make any difference. So, well, let's just pick on a few and see what they say. See, now this one, why pH is important when growing orchids, yeah? Right, so we got, uh, let's take a pH of around 6.5, the high end of our recommended bit. You're going to get your nitrogen, you're going to get your phosphorus, you'll get your potassium. You would get your sulfur if you flipping had some. Your calcium start to tail off. Your magnesium is tailing off quite dramatically on this chart. Your iron is also not at its full extent of absorption at around 6.5. Yeah? Manganese, boron, copper, zinc, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right, let's come down to our lower end and say just below six. Nitrogen's okay, phosphorus okay, potassium okay. So would sulfur be if we add some. Calcium's now starting to drop off quite dramatically. Magnesium is dropping off badly. Iron starts to increase a bit as it drops down. Right, we've got this. Basically, most of the time in my van der bucket, I've been adding feed at whatever level, the level's not quite so important, and I've been guessing the amount of citric acid, because of my unreliable pH meter, to drop it down a bit. Because I know from past experience with the MSU fertilizer, if I start with seven as a base and take the TDS reading to about 150, my pH will drop 0.2. So it's going to go down to about 2.8. 
well that's too high I don't want it that high so I'll get a little bit of citric acid and dunk it in the bucket on the assumption it's dropping the pH down to somewhere sensible but I've been guessing and I would suggest we've solved the problem because I've been under guessing and not putting anywhere near as much in as I need um, I just want to pick on a couple of other charts we've only looked at one let's have a look at the next one right where are we then 6.5 blow all the little ones see now on this one at 6.5 iron is tailing off heading upwards to a more, uh, more alkaline pH but it's still there in reasonable quantities so is magnesium so is calcium sulfur and the rest going up are fine so that's that chart what about this one Ah, now this one's not bad because it does a comparison. Mineral soils, soilless mix. Well, we're in the soilless mix, aren't we? So let's find our between 6 and 6.5. Yeah. Iron, on this chart, says it's quite reasonable. <laughs> Magnesium is okay at 6.5, it says, but it's tailing off dramatically as we head down towards 6. Calcium comes and goes, but is still there in reasonable quantities. On this chart, it says phosphorus drops off dramatically as the pH increases up towards 6.5. Well, that's the first chart that said that. Potassium and nitrogen, fine. What else we got then? What's this pretty coloured one saying? Let's pick our 6.5 again. Forget the little ones, I'm not fussed. Sulfur's okay, magnesium's okay, iron's dropped off dramatically. And it says phosphates, calcium, potassium and nitrates. Well, let's use a word that's not on any other the chart. So sorry, Mr. Chart, you get disregarded. This is a cheerful one. What have we got here? Let's go up 6.5, blah, 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 blah. On this chart, iron looks quite good. So does magnesium, so does calcium, and so does everything. So that chart says everything's okay at 6.5. Not sure I'm happy with that chart. <laughs> See what I mean about the variable information on this. Um, right, this particular one uh, is our 6.5, blah, 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 blah. Iron is um, reduced a bit, but not gone. Magnesium's reduced, calcium's reduced, sulfur, potassium, phosphorus, nitrogen are all fine. I think we get a general drift, don't we? just the gist of what sort of thing is going on. Right, my conclusions. I'd like people to agree, disagree, and if you're gonna disagree or agree, I could quite like the reasons, but I think I haven't been dropping my pH down low enough during the winter. Now the metabolism of the plant is gonna be slower in the winter due to short days, lack of light, and lack of heat. So the plant has slowed right down. Well, in doing so, if stuff's not moving around the plant so easily or so well or for so long because of the short days, it might be uh, missing out in parts of the plant. So I'm going to basically say this is a chlorophyll problem, or lack of it in this particular case, brought on by insufficient magnesium and iron. Now I need to work out what the hell I'm going to deal with, how to deal with that. And as a separate issue, I now need to go away and try and find out why the hell this MSU fertilizer has no sulfur. Because I'd have at least expected it to be in the micro elements. It's just missing. Well, I've done enough reading around the subject to actually know that sulfur is, is very relevant and it should be there. Uh, we go back to our, uh, where are we? We go back to our, this one. You know, you've got your three uh, macros, the NPK, and then you've got your three lesser but very important ones, calcium, magnesium and sulfur. It's there in black and white, and I've seen this in many places. It needs to be there, and it's part of chlorophyll formation. And this is the first winter that I've gone through with a potential for zero sulphur. 
what the hell I'm going to use to add that in and how much, I really don't know. I'll look into it. But that's the sort of thing I would do in the background. And this is probably dragged on and some people have gone to sleep, some people have emigrated, some people have gone to bed. Um, but it was important for me to go through this and for, for me to explain the sort of thing I would do when I've got a problem. I just haven't, not 100% sure I've solved the problem, but I think we're looking at it here, down there, iron, no sulphur, and a possible pH a bit on the high side. Yeah? Right. I can't say I hope you've enjoyed that, because I haven't enjoyed doing it, but it was a necessity. And I have no 100% solution, but I think I'm on the right track. And if I think about it, there's some other plants with this as well. Some of my Phalaenopsis are a bit like this. Got a few yellowing sort of spots and marks and pale leaves and stuff. I think the plants are getting a bit deprived of chlorophyll. Now in the winter, that could be the short days, and on my Phalaenopsis, they got brought into the house. So they have been severely <laughs> lacking in light, shall we say, and we all know that the light is the driving force between photosynthesis and therefore the chlorophyll production, along with these bits. So I'm on the right track. Um, one day down the line, if I ever get a definitive answer, I'll post it. But that's I'm going to leave that at that for now. But just to look at the sort of things I would be looking at. <laughs> now, how many different pH charts did you see me look at? Quite a lot. How many versions of this have you seen me look at? None. Do you know why? Because of that at the top of the page. It says Michigan State University. Yeah? They are the ones that created that MSU formula. They are the ones that have said this is all about it. And they are the ones that have got sulphur on the list. Yeah, so although my fertilizer is based on the MSU yeah, formulation, it wasn't produced by Michigan State University, was it? I can't believe somebody like that would miss out sulphur. So I'm just going over the small print on here to see if it's in the small print. That's just basically the elements they've used to get this. And sulphur ain't there. Hmm, a conundrum. A real conundrum. I'll work on it. <laughs> I'll be back.